just to let you know that at the end of the service, we have uh, several people who are joining the church. And if you would like to join Fellowship Church, we'd love to have you. Just fill out one of the, fill out the I'm New card with your information, and we'd love to have you come and do that. Also, hey, the water's fine here, so I just want you to know at the 11 o'clock service, if you want to come back, have your baptism renewed or be baptized for the first time, please let us know. Uh, we would love to be able to do that. The last time we did baptisms, we had someone come back and who uh, was baptized at the 11 o'clock service after being in the 930 service. So we would love to, uh, to have you guys with us. And I, I can't see as well today, but okay, there's El Elliot and Maddie's there and Mallory's not there, but I just heard something. Where, where's Mallory at? Raise your hand. Okay. I heard something, uh, Kathy Henderson, who kind of runs the show here for us, uh, Kathy despises the fact I say that, but the fact is she kind of, she's kind of uh, in charge or just know this. I've known that it's a good thing to say, yes, ma'am, and do what I'm told. I mean, I just, I know that. Uh, but she was telling me the story about, Sean, you came home one afternoon and Maddie and Mallory were baptizing their Barbies. Uh, and you found them at home doing that. So again, that just kind of lives that out. So if you want your kids to be baptized later on, let them baptize their little dolls and stuff, and they'll get into the mood. So uh, I thought that was great. Um, there's a story about a, a college recruiter who went to a high school to see uh, a, a wonderful athlete. It was very tall. A probably kid was probably about 6'5". It uh, was amazing, and he was trying to get the kid to come to his university. While he was there, he saw a, kind of a short and stocky point guard, about 5'8", but could do some amazing things. And so he made his pitch to the young man who everybody was looking at, and he knew that there wouldn't be that many looking at this 5'8 kid. And he walked over to him and said, hey, you're pretty good. He said, yeah, I'm the best. He said, you're the best? He goes, yeah, I'm the best. How many points do you average uh, a game? He goes, uh, 45. 45, that's incredible. What other things do you do? He goes, I'm the best rebounder on the team. This is the 5'8 kid, and I'm the 6'6", six, 6'5 six, six, kid. He's, you know, didn't mention him. He said, yeah, in fact, we've been undefeated in three years. We've been undefeated in three state titles, and the truth is, it's all because of me. And uh, the coach said, uh, or the recruiter said, do you have any weaknesses? And the kid looked at me and said, yeah, I tend to exaggerate. <laughs> we all have weaknesses. Some of us have physical weaknesses. Some of us, of us have um, mental weaknesses or emotional weaknesses, relational maybe moral weaknesses. But all of us deal with some kind of, of weakness in our life. And how we handle that weakness in our life, I believe, determines the quality of our life and from a Christian perspective, the power in our lives. We deal, we deal with weaknesses. Paul, the most prolific writer in all the Bible, had a weakness. He called it the thorn in his flesh. We're not sure what it is. It could have been migraines or epileptic seizures. Um, if it was epilepsy or epileptic seizures, he's in good company because we understand that Julius Caesar and, and um, who else was it? Julius Caesar and Napoleon also dealt with epilepsy. And there wasn't any Dilantin or Phenobarbital at the time to help control the seizures. He had a thorn and he was stuck with it. And he prayed to God. He asked God, the Bible tells us, three times to remove that thorn in his flesh. And our scripture today is the answer that God gave him. And what I'd like us to do is put this on the, uh, uh, on the screen because I would like for us to read this all together. As we finish our series, Jesus is Enough, the, the real reality that God's grace is sufficient for us. Jesus is enough. But let's, let's read this together. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulty. And then this powerful statement, all together now, for when I am weak then I am strong. 
May God add his blessing, his power, and his hope to the reading of his holy word. What God is really telling Paul in this passage this morning is this. Trust me, Paul, I will take care of you. But I can use your weaknesses to demonstrate my power. I can use your weaknesses to demonstrate my power. The basic underpinning of this theological understanding that God can take our weaknesses and bring power from them is the concept of grace. God's grace toward us. God's grace is unmerited favor. It's a gift. It's not something you deserve. It's something you receive. In the book of Ephesians, it says, that for our salvation, God's grace. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. God's grace... It's what brings salvation to us. God's grace is the power in our Christian life. It, it, it's made available through the grace of God. And that's why I've told you and said to you probably now the fourth time since I've been here that we are Wesleyan, Wesleyan Arminian, if you want to understand, in our theological position. Every church has a theological position. Every preacher has a theological position. Mine is being a Wesleyan Arminian. And what that means is this, is that everything is founded in the grace of God. There is provenient grace. It is the grace that comes from the day we were conceived to the day we received Jesus Christ. God is reaching out to you. You've heard me say this. The Bible doesn't say in the beginning Mac. It says in the beginning God. God initiates everything and all our lives are is a response to that initiation of God's grace in our lives. And that initiation begins when we are born. And in the families we are in, we either, we either are, are, are seeking to, to uh, speak God into our children or we don't speak God at all into them. We're, we're taking them hopefully to church. We're taking them to vacation Bible school. Hopefully they're seeing us pray. Hopefully they're seeing that we're seeking to be a Christian family. We want God to be at the center. And please know, please know that impacts their lives. You may not see it right now, but it impacts their lives. And the power of the Holy Spirit is there. And they look in creation and they see that there's an orderliness, that there's intelligent design. I mean, dogs look like dogs. Cat looks like, cats look like cats. Trees look like trees. The provenient grace is God just pouring into us and, and, and really wooing us. It's kind of like when I met Sharon. Sharon, uh, of course, just a beautiful woman. And when we were younger, uh, I just, I did everything I could to woo her. I'm serious because, in fact, in fact, <laughs> this is so funny. I met her at a conference and I knew I might not see her again. And so I asked her out at this conference and uh, come to find out later, she said, well, I can see you about, uh, maybe we can do something about 8 o'clock. And I'm like, oh, no, no, I, can, I have to leave at 8 o'clock. I can, I, can, I can be with you. It's not embarrassing. It's okay. The reason she had to leave is because she had another date. Yeah. She really thought a lot of me. She had another date. She had somebody better. She was, you know, I don't know what happened there. I never even asked, you know. Oh, he didn't show. That didn't watch. That's right. He didn't. See, he did better. Uh, but I was wooing Sharon. God woos us in that stage of provenient grace. And, and then there's that time and that moment. It could be at vacation Bible school. It could be when my boys, when Michael Austin, Austin was six. And Michael was, was about five years old, four years old. And they sat by and said, Daddy, we want to ask Jesus into our heart. It could be when the twins were seven. We were in Ireland and they said, Daddy, we want to ask Jesus into our heart. And, and at that moment, we, we call that justifying grace. And it could be at seven. It could be at 10. It could be at 14 or 24 or 34 or 44 or 64. There's that moment of saying, I want to accept Jesus Christ. The ability to accept Jesus Christ and believe in faith is grace. You don't do anything. God gives you not only the invitation, he helps you, he gives you the response. It's grace. And then from that moment until the day we go to heaven is what we call sanctifying grace. 
And that is the grace of God that says, I'm going to help you lead the Christian life. Please understand, in and of yourself, you're going to totally fail at seeking to live this life called being a Christian. You can't do it. I can't do it. And the reason we fail is because we think that in and of ourselves, we can be the people God wants us to be. You can't. You're going to fail miserably. But God says, I'm going to give you the power of the Holy Spirit to help you in your weaknesses and to help strengthen you so that you can, so that you can be the person I desire for you to be. And I can, I can move in your life and you can make a difference in the world. It's all, it's all grace. Robert Louis Stevenson said this, there's nothing but God's grace. We walk upon it, we breathe it, we live it, and we die by it. It's all grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found. I was blind, but now I see. April 19th, 1982, I was laying in bed and my life was a mess. And I don't know, for some of you who may not, I'm blind in my left eye. I got in and out of the baseball when I was younger. I can't see anything. So if you ever are on my left side, I'm not being rude. I just can't see you. And that night, I was, the, the, the song Amazing Grace came up into my, my, my mind. And I came to that last verse, was blind, but now I see. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Mac, you are not physically blind. You're ultimately spiritually blind because you're not seeing God's love for you and how much God cares for you. And you may be healed right now of your blindness physically, but until you're healed spiritually, you're never going to see. And that night, I received Jesus Christ in a transformative way that literally has, is the point of why I'm here right now. It's all, it's all about grace, folks. And let's just walk through this passage real quick. My grace is sufficient for you. It's, it, this is personal. This is not some template. God is not just saying, hey, I want to give you grace like, you know, for God so loved the whole world. It wasn't just the whole world. So God loved Sharon and Dee and Karen and Richard. There's people and Tom and Wes. For God so loved. It's specific. It's personal. My grace is sufficient for you where are you weak today where are you struggling some of us have bad tempers some of us have some addiction we're struggling with some of us are, 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 are we, we're arrogant or we're prideful some of us let everybody run over us there's some weakness in our life and what God is saying is, I don't just give a generalized grace to you. I give you a personalized grace that meets you where you are in the depth of your soul, in the darkness of who you are. I will meet you right there. My power, can we back up? My grace is sufficient. My grace is it's not past tense, it's not future tense. It's not, it's not my grace will be future tense or my grace has been. It is my grace is right now. God has grace to meet you right now where you are. My grace is what? Sufficient. Jesus is enough. He's saying, look, my grace is sufficient for you. Did you know that the earth and my wife, I didn't ask you to confirm this last night, but since I'm talking to you today in our dating life, I thought, let me just do this. Is it not true, Sharon, that with the sun, that the earth really only gets a fraction of the, the sun's heat and energy is that, and light? We only get a fraction of it. Is that correct? Thank you for saying that. That really helps me in my message. I mean, the honest truth is, the resource, the, the resource of the sun is greater than the earth needs. That's right. Thank you so much. The resource of the sun is greater than the earth needs. It's an oversupply of, of energy. It's an oversupply of light that God has provided for us more than we need. And God tells us in his word that he gives us grace that's just like the sun. That he gives us more than we need. There's more than enough grace for you. In whatever you're dealing with that God has for you, he gives you an abundance of that. My grace is sufficient for you. And then it goes on to say, my power is made perfect in weakness. 
This is what's interesting. This is really the, the paradox that God can take our weaknesses and make them strengths. The truth is the very thing that you're struggling with today, the very thing that's maybe harmful to you or harmful to other people, the very thing that really is the thorn in your flesh, God is saying, if you will give that to me, I will literally take that very thorn in your flesh and I'll make it a crown upon your head. I, I, I will take that very thing that you're weakest at and I will bring strength from it. Not your strength, but God's strength. Because what God is saying is, you've got to give up your human strength in order to have divine strength. Because the truth is, we try to will it. We try to fix it ourselves. And you can't. You cannot fix it yourself. What we have to do is give it to God. How many times? Over and over and over and over again. Not three times, not 30 times. Sometimes in a day, you have to give it over constantly. But what you discover as you continually give over that weakness to God and you seek divine strength, that God begins to give you divine strength. He begins to give you that stability. He begins to give you that confidence that this weakness is not going to define the rest of your life. That this weakness is not going to define who you are or what you do. That what ultimately defines you is not what you've done, but what Jesus did. What ultimately defines you is God in your life. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. He goes on to say, I delight in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. He not only says what the, he not only uses the word weaknesses, but he begins to define it. Hardships, insults persecution, in difficulties. How many of you today, don't raise your hand, are tired? How many of you today are tempted? How many of you today are troubled? What Paul is saying is if you're tired, if you're tempted or troubled, if you're dealing with insults, hardships, persecutions, or difficulties, give them to me. And I will literally take the very thing that you think is a burden and it will become an opportunity for you, for growth. And it will be opportunity for me to be glorified in your life. The final thing is this. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's the thing we struggle with. I think sometimes in Christianity and in the American culture, it's so difficult because we're so dang independent. And we want to kind of do things on our own. And we people pulling themselves up by their, their bootstraps. And independence is a word that we're founded on. And yet dependence is the word for the Christian. We are dependent upon God. And we don't like that weakness. And the very thing we don't like is the very key to our spiritual power and growth. God wants to meet you at your greatest point of weakness so that he can give you his strength. And he can not only show you his strength in your life so that you, people can see God's strength in and through the weaknesses you face right now. Let me close with this. I had a different ending. And then last night, Jenny Shelton, who is the other person in charge here uh, at, at Fellowship, who I also say yes, ma'am, and do what she says, um, sent me an email from Craig Mullen. Some of you may not know who Craig Mullen is. Craig and Paula Mullen are incredible members of this congregation. They've been here from the Oakland days. Uh, they have been incredible leaders, one of the most loving families that I've ever met. And they are great people. They have Clint and Jenna and Gabe and Michael and Luke. And... Uh, in the spring of 2016, uh, Craig had gallbladder surgery. He came out of that. His back was hurting. He went to see a doctor. And Paula sent uh, this email to our, uh, our staff. Now, let me just say that when I read this email last night, the first thing I read was, was this. And can we bring that up? And this is what Craig started with. Faith in God has not saved people from hardships and trials, but it has enabled them to bear tribulations courageously to emerge victoriously. Now, he didn't know what I was preaching on today, and I didn't know that this would be sent to me. But let me give you a little bit of the background. So back in May, an email is received that says this. 
Paula said, Craig was told that he had cancer a few weeks ago by a doctor in Murfreesboro. We have been seeing different doctors at Vanderbilt since that time for answers. Today, he was diagnosed with leukemia. He has a gra large grapefruit-sized tumor on his spine and aorta, and they are giving him a 10% chance of survival. Unfortunately, the cancer has spread to the, his bloodstream, and they think bone marrow. Craig will be admitted to Vanderbilt Hospital tomorrow morning, May 6th, for the next 21 days for aggressive chemotherapy. Please pray for complete healing for Craig. Please pray for strength and peace for Craig, Clint, Jenna, Gabe, Michael, Luke, and me. Paula says, love, Paula. Then last night, and they've been, we've watched, for many of you, you've, you've seen their journey. Last night, we received this um, email. Again, with that on the top. Faith in God is not saved people from hardships and trials, but enables them to bear tribulations courageously and emerge victoriously. Here's, here's a letter. Here's an email from Craig last night. God has been really gracious to me. I'm doing great. I've had two bone marrow biopsies. Both show no cancer. I've had a PET scan, a body x-ray showed no cancer. Blood test, no cancer. The cancer has been removed from my blood, bones, and the tuber around my spine and the aor. <laughs> excuse me. The, the tumor has been, the cancer has been removed from my blood, bones, and the tumor around my spine and aorta is gone. Amen. I am in remission and I'm very grateful. Beyond words grateful. My stem cells are now 99% my sister's healthy cells, and I am now her blood type. My blood counts are now normal. I haven't had any major side effects for about three weeks. I'm still sleeping around 16 hours, 18 hours a day when I'm, but when I'm awake, I'm much stronger. I've been going to the transplant clinic and physical therapy three times a week. Things are getting much easier. So much easier that my doctors have said, from that I can go home. Amen. <laughs> Going home. We are moving home a month earlier, just in time for Thanksgiving. You can imagine this will be a special day for my family and me with a whole new meaning. We praise God and thank Him for everything. Paul and I want to thank all of you as well. We have never felt alone. Your prayers, cards, meals, calls, texts, kind words, financial gifts, we humbly thank you. Many of you have asked about my prog prognosis, and here it is. I have stumped the doctor since I was diagnosed with cancer. First, they didn't know that they could help me. Then they gave me a 10% chance of survival. Once I went into remission, they said there was a 90% chance that the cancer would come back without a bone marrow transplant. At the beginning of the bone marrow transplant, they gave me a 30% chance of living. And now they say I have a 50% chance of survival. While I am extremely thankful for everything my wonderful doctors, nurses have done on my behalf and the sacrifices they make daily for me, I choose to believe God's report. I am healed. I will walk in the healing God has given me. And then he says this, and this is the next slide. Knowing that while none of us knows what tomorrow brings, I do know the one who is in control of it. And I'm good with that. My grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. Our entire family loves you, thanks you, and can't wait to see you. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. Conquer and overcome. Craig. Jesus is enough. In your weakness, Jesus is enough. What I, we're going to do is we're, uh, just, 
I know we've got people joining here in just a second, but I'd like to have, we can, just a couple of minutes of altar time if we could, because I know for some of you, what you need to do is come and say, God, I got this weakness and I need to give it to you. I, I, I'm tired of working in my strength. I'm tired. I'm troubled. I'm tempted. I'm tired of operating on my own. I want your divine strength now in my life. Let's pray and then we'll come. God, I thank you that your grace is sufficient for us. That your power is made perfect in our weakness. And God, I pray that you would just uh, today just infuse our lives with strength and confidence and grace. That we may feel your presence and walk from this place, not defeated, but victorious. Not because of what we've done, but because of what you're doing in us. And let us understand we walk in that. It's not a one-time thing. It's day to day. In Jesus' name. Would you come?